Thank you, brethren, for all your kindness, for your gentleness, for your words of comfort throughout the years. Um, I, for one, have been a recipient of God's grace as it came to me through you, through each one of the joints and bands ministering together, I've been comforted. And I want to praise God for that. Amen. And I also want to give thanks to the Lord that I know where Jesus is. Amen. That I'm not looking for him in the desert. I'm not running after him in some new fad or some new cultural advancement. I know where Jesus is. Amen. He's at the right hand of God, exalted. That's where Jesus is. So if you want to find Jesus, you're going to have to go to the right hand of God. He doesn't really appear anyplace else now. Now, Paul said it, and I just believe what he said. He said, lastly of me, we're talking about Jesus' personal appearance. He, he said, lastly of me. I just, I just accept that. Maybe that makes me simple, but then again, simple is not always bad. You know, I mean, when you're talking about whether or not I'm going to trust in God or trust in the, in the hand of flesh, I would rather side with God. Amen. Now we have a therefore. I'll read the text, Acts 2.33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So we have a therefore. He's a, there's a reasoning language. He's reasoning with these brethren. Yes. These were holy brethren, right? Amen. These were holy brethren. Now some of them were, were scoffing. They were mocking. They said, these men are drunk. They didn't understand, admittedly. The apostle didn't stand up and say, you bunch of dummies. He addressed them like brethren, didn't he? Yeah. It's always safe to address the brethren as brethren. Being, we have a therefore, we have... We have just a couple of key points here. We have being by the right hand of God. That's a big point, by the way. We have exalted. you got to think about these things. And received of the Father. Oh, he received something of the Father. The promise. <laughs> now, see, if you want the therefore in light of that, you're going to have to go way back. Because that's how big the therefore is there. You know, it's way back when he gave the promise. Peter stands up, having full cognition of what's going on, and, and he, he, he's, he's in command of the situation. He identifies they don't know what's going on. I do. So him, along with the 11. Now, I'm not going to read the whole second chapter. I was tempted to. It's a good chapter. But I had to say, wait a minute now. My brother know the second chapter. And so I can just allude to a few things. I can have that liberty, can't I? He received of the Father the promise, which is identically to what we needed. We needed the promise to be fulfilled. There was a promise, and um, we needed it. If we were ever going to understand what was going on in the kingdom of God, this has got to happen. we got to have a therefore. we got to be able to reason this thing out that I can't handle it on my own. And my own... Even if he, let's just say that, that, that he could somehow redeem me, give me a new man, independent of the Holy Spirit, even at that, I wouldn't understand what was going on. He would have worked something on me that was external that I wouldn't understand. And I would never have the capacity to be able to understand where Jesus is had I not received the promise. The promise. The promise of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he has shed this forth. He's the one that did it. Peter knew it, and Peter knew they didn't. So there we get into this, um, this kind of language here. Therefore, uh, the most immediate connection, and I, didn't want, I don't, didn't want that to be a distraction, but see, the, the therefore really does go back to the very beginning of chapter 2. I mean, if you really want to get uh, understanding, you're going to have to have a working understanding of what's going on in chapter 2 to know what he's... Picking up on verse 33, 
But the most immediate connection that I wanted to make that was most applicable to what I'm talking about is actually in verse 32. So let's just read that. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. We're witnesses of this. We, we were there. We walked around with Jesus for three years. And then we saw him die. And we've seen him after he rose from the dead. We're witnesses of his majesty. We're witnesses. So when, I, when Peter stands up and starts talking, it's time to start listening, right? He's a witness. He was there. Peter has exposed what these devout men out of every nation under heaven had thought about this Jesus. Remember, he, he brought it to their attention. I'm going to remind you what you did with Jesus. I'm going to remind you. You took him and you crucified him. That's what you thought about Jesus. Then he's going to tell them, while well, God thought about Jesus. What did, what did God think about Jesus? He raised him from the dead. That's what God thought about Jesus. Amen. He raised him up higher than the heavens. He seated him at his own right hand, and he makes the connection. It's like a hardwired connection. Jesus is there. That's why this is going on. Amen. Of course, now, some places you couldn't say that, right? Some places you'd have to go there and say, I don't see any connection. If there's not a connection, we have to at least be honest enough to say it, right? That's what Peter was doing. Peter, Peter wasn't caring what they thought about what he said. Peter was explaining to them what's going on because he wasn't content with them to walk away thinking they were drunk. Well, a lot of places I go away from thinking that they're drunk. It's a truth. It's a truth. It's foolishness, in other words. Foolishness going on. Things that people do when they don't have all their senses. But that's not all Peter told them. Peter went on to give them the answer, didn't he? Remember, they, they told them what they did, told them what God did, and, and they were pricked in their heart. They were. They were pricked in their heart. You're going to meet some people like this. You're going to start telling them about Jesus and what he's done. And what you're doing, you're looking for the sensitivity. Are they sensitive? Because if they are, we got some good news for these people. We got some good news. There's a promise out there. Are you serious? Is your heart yearning to be where Jesus is at? Well, hey, we got some good news for you. Good news. He's opened up a way. He's opened up a way whereby his banished would not be expelled from him. See, he, God doesn't want to expel you. He wants to, to bring you to Christ. Bring you to Christ. Why? Because he knows that Christ is the mandated servant. He's the one that can take away your sin, sanctify you wholly, and someday present you faultless without any blame at all. No wrinkles. I'm looking forward to the wrinkle-free time. See, Peter's going to eventually lead them to the right conclusion because he knows they can't do it for themselves. Now, you can do this. You can lead people to the right conclusion. I don't have to beat people up over the head. They'll do it themselves. You just tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. And if they're serious, if their heart is pricked, they'll say, what must we do? What? Tell us. I can tell you know God. I've lived through this. I've seen this in people. They knew God, and I wanted to know him too. Why? Because I saw. I saw the truth. I saw what it really was. In other words, they assisted me to form a proper conclusion. That's what he said. Therefore, that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus. Talking about the same one you crucified. The same one that you cast aside. Ah, God hath made that same Jesus who you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And he's Lord in Christ. Whether anyone sees it on this planet, he is at the right hand of God, exalted. That's what he is. This same Jesus. Now, I was thinking as I was preparing this, that you know what? We have a lot of Jesuses in our time. We have a lot of strange Jesuses. A lot of imposters. A lot of false Jesus. See, what, what the false Jesus does is he promises you something that Jesus, the real one that's at the right hand of God, hasn't promised. He gives you confidence in areas where you should not be confident. A person should not be confident that God will overlook their sin. 
A person should never be confident about stuff like this. How about you being confident that Jesus doesn't care what you do? Or that God somehow has, uh, Jesus has altered his perception of sin. And that when he laid down his life, God was so delighted that he just overlooked sin. Well, we know this isn't true because when he, that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, God turned, as it were, his face from him. And he made his soul an offering for sin. So now we know forever, let it be known forever, that God hates sin, even when it's on his beloved. So therefore, being by the right hand of God and exalted, this is the same Jesus now, the same Jesus they crucified, that they took advantage of, that they... They pushed it aside. This is the same one that God set at his own right hand. See, that's important to know. It's not another Jesus. Remember the angels told him, the same Jesus that you've seen go, the same one. He's coming back. It's not another Jesus. Technically, there is not another Jesus. The others, it's already been stated, they're just figments of our imagination. If a man will feel comfortable in doing something that God has revealed he hates, he is deceived. That's what he is. This same Jesus. Now this is the one. See, we have a lot of, and I can only go over a few for time's sake. We have a lot of indicators of who this Jesus is. And he's given us this in order that we might check up on ourselves. Do you serve the right Jesus? Well, see, if you, if you check up on yourself, you'll know. You'll have confidence that I'm following the Lamb with the sword we go. I, I, I'm submitting to him. If he reveals something that, that it's got to go, I don't say, does it have to be that? That, that, that's the sin I like. That's the sin I've cultured. And I've hid over in the corner. Nobody knows about it but me and you. This is the one that was born of a virgin. Is your, was your Jesus born of a virgin? You start talking about that out loud and you'll get, you'll get some controversy going. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This is the one now. This is the one you've gone to him, the one that has never sinned. This is the one that has never sinned. Even though he was made to be sin, he never sinned. So now he doesn't understand when you sin. This is just nonsense. Come to Jesus, he understands if I sin. No, he doesn't. He's never sinned. And you got to stop sinning. He, he found himself. Now, now imagine this. Just imagine this, which you can't, but try. That you were in the beginning with God. All things were made by you. It, you it, everything that was made in the whole universe. You, you weren't like deficient in any knowledge or understanding. You had all the comprehension. And now you found yourself in the form of a man. That's quite a wake up, wouldn't it? Yeah. Found yourself. Now, okay, now, how are you going to handle this? You've been found as a man. I, I'm a man. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This is the one we're talking about. This is the one that's at the right hand of God. He made himself of no reputation. This is what he was sent here to do. You want to find out what it's like to be a man? You can't do it from heaven. You can't do it. You're going to have to come down here and to be made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, you're going to have to condemn sin in the flesh. This is what you're going to have to do now if you're going to save man. You're going to have to know what it's like to be a man. All right, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. Even though he was Lord of all, he's the, in the form of a servant? Well, surely that's low enough. He doesn't have to go any lower to find out. I mean, he, he's been tempted in all points. He's, he's in the form of a servant. He even washed their feet, right? He was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man... God humbled him. No. He humbled himself. And now, if he's in you, you will find yourself humbling yourself. This will happen. You can't make somebody humble themselves. You can try. A lot of prisons are full of people who they've tried to humble. But you see, 
when you find yourself humbling yourself, what is that? Is this like a flag, a red flag? I'm one of his sons. He's in me, I know, because I prefer the brethren over my own interest. What does that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. He humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death. Came in the world to die, but not just any death. Not just any death. A shameful death. One that, that we deserved. He, he took our death. We couldn't come back from it. He did come back. And that's what the apostle is saying. This same Jesus, the same one that died, he's come back. Now, <laughs> this is good news. This is good news. He's, he's come back now. He's at the right hand of God. He's not. He, he didn't suffer him to see corruption. No, no, not the Holy One. He didn't see, he didn't suffer him. What did he do? He, he set him at his own right hand. Now, this is the same Jesus. This is the same Jesus that's going to come in power and glory. The same one. I already mentioned that. This is the same Jesus that will judge the world to righteous. The same one. This is the Jesus we're talking about. The same one that's going to give to every man according to his deeds. I know it's not popular to say that, but it's going to happen anyway. Even if a whole generation starts believing that they're not going to have to give an account, they're going to have to anyway. Amen. Now see, technically before the event that Peter's talking about could ever happen, all these other things had to happen first. So all these other things. Jesus had to suffer being tempted before the promise could ever be given. Why? Because we had to have a faithful the high priest. We had to have a great high priest. One that had been, had not only just looked at men, he had been a man. And now as a man, ascended up into heaven and seat, sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus, this is the one that was already victorious. He wasn't trying to be victorious. He is. He already destroyed the devil. He's already done. Amen. Left him here, left him here so that we could sort of like Find out what it's like. You know, you don't you know nothing about fighting until you get a new man. You get a new man, all of a sudden you start, you start doing some battling. See, God had a battle plan. And the battle plan, the, 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 the leader, you know, our, our captain of our salvation, he, he destroyed, he actually destroyed the Goliath. He did the Goliath's work, and we're just like the Israelites, remember, they, they ran after him then. Goliath's dead! Come on, guys! <laughs> and they, they just stormed him, didn't they? Oh, the great destruction that day. Great destruction. But see, David only killed one, right? All that I know of just killed one. Took his head back to Saul. <laughs> he entered in with his own blood, didn't he? Yeah. Destroyed him, Father! That wicked serpent. He had already put away sin. He had already ascended into the heavens. And the first thing he does when he gets there... Sits down at their majesty on high. All right. Time to get to work, Father. Time to get to work. We're going to send the promise. Father gives him it. Sends it to the church. Now, this is the way every blessing comes. Every blessing. See, he's at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's distributing the goods. Bringing many sons to glory. So, see, when I, when I think of the right hand of the majesty on high, there's a lot of different things that come to my mind. A lot of different things. Having received of the Father, God's never stepped down off of His throne from the very beginning. Through the entire work, He's, he's been the Father. He's been in charge. He's, he's God. Now he's, he's commissioned the Son to do a work, not only in heaven. See, what we're talking about is the work after the earth work. Now, the, the, Jesus had to come to earth, that's true. He had to put away sin. That was all a prerequisite in order for him to sit down. He was done with, he, he was done with that per, first work. But now there was actually a greater work. Yeah. Jesus entered into a greater work. The exaltation of Jesus was required to do a greater work. Yes, greater. Let this statement sink down into your ears. Being by the right hand of God exalted. Now, just saying the same thing as where's Jesus at? Jesus is at 
This is where he resides. This is where, the, this is where he does any work that he does is done from the right hand of God. Amen. See, th th this is not just a, a, a formal statement. Th this is a statement of fact. The right hand of God throughout the whole Bible depicts so a mindset, how you think about the right hand of God, God has established in the scriptures. It's not for us to say, you know, it's just like the left hand. No, it's not. It's not. God hasn't thought like that, and we shouldn't think like that. There's a, it's a specific place. Remember Jesus told the, the mother, it's not mine to give. And they come and they say, I want my son, you make my son sit on the right hand, and the other one. It's not mine to give. Well, who was he talking about? Whose was it to give? It was his father's, right? His father's. This is his plan. He's come to work this out. And now, the place, where did, what place did the father pick for Jesus? The right hand. The right hand. Jesus is like David Solomon. He's, 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 he's going to do my work. You know how, my, how bad David wanted to build the temple? He really wanted to do that. But see, he, God said, I'm going to let Solomon do it. Solomon's going to do this. God, God needed Christ. Now I get in trouble for saying that, but you know what? How much could God do without Christ? You think about that. How far is salvation going to get unless someone comes and takes sin away? It's just God's Christ, and he needed him because he wanted to do it this way. It's not like God's deficient in anything. Don't misunderstand me. But if God's going to save men, he needs Christ. Remember John, the beloved, they exiled him to an island. Now, I'm sure they had the reasons that they don't anymore. <laughs> All the reasons they could come up with were getting rid of John, been long gone. But what John got on that island, he wouldn't trade for anything in the world. When, that, when, when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, oh, I'm telling you, this, this more than compensated for other men not wanting to be around him. As long as God's around me, I really don't care if other men are around me. In Revelation chapter 5, I mean, I'm talking about this Jesus. And I'm talking about the right hand of God. Okay? And in this chapter, you see both. Talking about one that's worthy and a book that was in the right hand of God. Okay? There was something that God needed done, in other words that he made a point of it in Scripture that there was only one who could do it. Amen. Only one. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. This is a reality. God wants to do something. He wrote it down in a book. It wasn't going to change. And from the very beginning, known unto God are all his works. He knows what he wants. And he wrote it in a book and he's got it in his hand. And now, if it's going to be implemented, if it's going to be done, well, the right man has to be chosen, right? you got to have the right man for this project. Things that end up in the right hand of God, we can know one thing for sure. They're going to be accomplished. Nothing's going to stay his hand. Nothing. Now, you know, there was an uprising. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's got enemies. Oh, yeah, this one, this fallen cherub, yeah, he thought he was going to do something. He thought he was going to lift himself up and be like the Most High. All right, so the, obviously this is by design because, remember, there's a book here. We got a book. All right, so see, for, for those who say, well, yeah, but, you know, God just reacted, they forgot about the book. They forgot about the book. It's in his hand. Known unto God are all his works. God's moving forward. See, God looked at the fall of Satan as moving forward. That's how God thought about it. He wasn't surprised. He was, all right, next, next. Cast him down to the earth. Oh, I'm not going to do it. I wouldn't waste my time. Angels, go take care of that. Just do what seems good to you. One of your fellows have fallen and you're going to have to go deal with them. And they did. We read it. They did. They fought. 
And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now you think about this. The search was made throughout the whole entire race of man, the, off of the earth, under the earth, everywhere. It was made. Who is worthy to open this book? The proclamation has gone out. Who is worthy? This is a good question. It's a good question even now. Who is worthy? Do you think you're worthy? Well, God can make you worthy. <laughs> but you're going to need this worthy one to do it. All right. Who is worthy to carry out this eternal purpose? Well, one, you're going to have to be eternal. It's true. No mortal man... I mean, how, what is, it's, let's say you live 969 years. At the end of that, you died, right? So, yep, you can't do this work. In order to do this work, you have to have no beginning of days and no end of life. That's what you got to have. You, in other words, you have to be divine to do this work. This is a very specific work. All right, who's worthy to bring many sons to glory? See, if you start looking at the eternal purpose of God and then looking for someone to carry it out, you're kind of limited in your scope, is what I mean. Who is worthy to bear the winepress of the wrath of God alone? Which one of you could step forward and say, oh, how about Abraham? We got an Abraham here. He's, how about Moses? Oh, even John the Baptist. Come on. Y'all, maybe all of you together can get, no, it can't be done. Who is worthy to destroy the devil and the false prophet and the beast? And to stand in the evil day. An evil day. When even the Father is turned, as it were, his face from you. Can you do that? If you are, then step forward and take the book. John, no doubt, paid special attention while this search was being done. We know this because of his reaction. No man in heaven, nor in earth, Neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look therein. And this was unacceptable. I know a lot of people may say, well, it's time to go home. The meeting's over. But this was unacceptable to John. He wasn't leaving. So what it says. The final result is after everything's been tallied, and Adam's race have been found to be totally vanquished by the fall. Not one of them could do this work. And you find the effectiveness of sin on the human race. That no one was worthy. None. So how does a godly man react to news like this? What does he do? Does he say, oh well, oh well, I guess God can't do what he wants, right? He said, I wept much. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. You can't even look into the purpose of God. You're unworthy. All right? So when the full impact of the implications of this situation hits John, he's moved to a place that, it, see, all that was left was just emotion. I, I can't do anything about this. John couldn't make the revelation go one millimeter forward. It was stopped. Okay. So, of course, John didn't see the whole picture, did he? He didn't see the whole picture. Let me tell you, before he left, he did. See, the Lord, he, he, he's inclined to open this up. The Lord loves to open this up. But see, until you want it opened up, it doesn't do any good to open it up. Until John saw there's, there's no one. It's not, there's no one. And he wept. See, he's, he's lamenting. Now, when God sees a lamenting heart because they don't understand the truth, believe me, someone's going to open it up. God's going to send someone. He wasn't weeping because he personally couldn't do it. He said, no man. No man. He saw the utter futility of any man taking on this project. But don't worry. Hope looms. <laughs> Bright in the glory. See? Bright. And one of the elders said to me, weep not. Weep not, John. No, I'm going to have to instruct you more perfectly here, John. Look at this. Weep not, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he prevailed to open the book. 
<laughs> this, is, this is our Savior. This is the same Jesus that's at the right hand of God exalted. This is the one that it came close to God. You can't get any closer to God. You can't get any closer than Jesus is. His own right hand. God's own right hand brought salvation. He did it himself. So anybody wants to tell me that obedience to baptism saves you, they're going to have to reword that. Because I read in my Bible, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto the death. Now, I'm not saying the baptism isn't part of it because that would be foolish, wouldn't it? But let me tell you something. Christ was doing the Father's will when he took away sin, and God's own right arm has brought salvation. In the end, when we stand before him, we give an account of the deeds done in the body, it won't be what you did isn't what will save you. It'll be what God did. Amen. According to thy name, Psalms 48.10 says, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. It's full of righteousness. You want righteousness? Go to God. He's full of righteousness. And see, it's not just that he's full of righteousness. He's inclined to give it to you. I know this because he sent Jesus to take away sin. And then he put him at his own right hand, the power side, the side where things get done, the working side of God. He set him there, a man, to distribute the goods. Oh, I like, like that thought. This book, which was in the right hand of God, would, would be opened by this same Jesus. See, it was important that John know this. See, lamenting, in the glory is not something to... We don't have to look forward to lamentation when we get to glory, believe me. But see, John was given to see the work as it progressed. That, that it, only God could do this. Only God's lamb could do this. So my topic today... I should get to my topic. Is that Jesus is at the right hand of God exalted. Now what does it mean? For this same Jesus, everything that God's done to introduce Jesus, what does it mean for this Jesus to be at the right hand of God? Or what does it just mean to, for you being at the right hand of God? Because remember now, you're in Christ. So wherever Jesus is, that's where you are. I'm talking about in the spirit. I know I'm not there physically yet. No one needs to tell me that. I know that. I experience that every day. But I won't experience that forever. Amen. I mean, I, it, there is, it's, he, there's hope. He's at the right hand of God, and you're in Christ, and so you're seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Psalms 118, 15 says, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is the tabernacles of the righteous. You think about that. <laughs> so how much have you been rejoicing <laughs> The right hand of the Lord doth value. Now, look at this. You, you, you have your own personal war going on. See, I have my own personal war going on, but my war is not any different than your war. I'm fighting against thoughts and things that would come up and try to distract me, and, and you can just take, him, just take him captive. Just reach out there and say, come here, thought. You've been bothering me. I want to sacrifice you to the Lord. You just could, come on, come a little closer. So I get my hands around you and I'm going to wrestle you down to the ground because you're going to... See, but see, these thoughts, why are they out there? Because we've got an enemy and he's casting fiery darts. I give thanks that he, he has to stick the darts. We've got that shield of faith. We can quench all these thoughts. Amen. Why can you quench them? Because you're in Christ who is at the right hand of God, exalted. Remember now, Jesus, Jesus is the one that's there. You're still here. You're very still much here. And yet, as you walk in the Spirit, you can be guaranteed that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because that's where He is. He's there. And see, as you walk in the Spirit, if you walk in the light as He is in the light, then see, you're, you're like in the protected zone. You're with Him. You're with the Lord. Nobody sins when they're with the Lord. Nobody sins when they're with Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't sin. So the key is, is to stick with Jesus. Stay with him. 
And then how can the devil get to you then? Well, he calls out, right, from the sidelines. Hey, come over here. Come over here. You know that, that, that thing that you used to like to do? It's still fun. Well, see, when you start growing in the Lord, you start, it starts to hurt. And you start seeing it as, That's, I don't got time for this. I only got this much time to live. And then I only got this much time to live. And pretty soon, I don't got no more time to live. So see, growing up in the Christ is essential if you're ever going to get down to being transformed into the image of His Son. Now I know that, you know, uh, I have some, know some close contacts that are still in the immature stage. And I don't expect them to be mature because they're immature. But I do see, I don't talk to them like they're babies. I don't treat them like they're just little infants that can't do anything. See, when you come into Christ, you're given certain capacities because you're put in Christ. You're put into the one who's at the right hand of God, the one that's exalted. So see, their progress isn't your responsibility as much as it is you showing them Christ. And when you show them Christ, he does the work, right? He's the one that, that matures people, not me. Jesus, remember Jesus told the high priest, high priest said, I adjure thee by the living God. Tell us, you know, if you want to know. This is what he told them. Thou hast said. <laughs> did, in other words, you should have known. I, I was, I've been here for a long time. You should have known. But nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now when this man, unless of course we give him, be charitable if they repent, but if they didn't, and they see Christ sitting at the right hand of God, it's not going to be anything like those who are in Christ. See, this Christ humbled himself once, and he's not going to again. Hebrews 1, 3 says, Who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, set, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, what is it like to be on the right hand of God? Well, there's a lot of characteristics about the right hand of God. There's majesty, right? The majesty. Oh, I always like that word. Isn't that a good? The majesty. You've been brought into the majesty. Okay? You've been put into Christ, and Christ is at the right hand of the majesty. I just think about it. It'll calm you down. So, I, I'm in the majesty. See, it sounds royal, doesn't it? Sounds royal. You, you've, been, you've been joined. You've been joined to Christ. You're one spirit. And in that spirit, you're part of the majesty. On high, the majesty. How about a whole throne of majesty? All right. We, we're supposed to say the writer of Hebrews said, We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, oh, by that, it's a compounded thought, isn't it? The throne, you're like a king, right? Oh, you are a king. You're not like one. You are one. You're a king and a priest under your God. And he set you in a throne. But not all. It's a throne of majesty, right? And, and, it's, and it's in the heavens. <laughs> so there's, there's the heavens. And then in the heavens, there's the throne. And in the throne, there's the majesty. You're in the majesty. Oh, I, 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 I want to... I want to do better. I want to do better every day because I'm headed for the majesty. In fact, when people see me, the way I react to stuff, I want them to think, that was very majestic. <laughs> very majestic. Amen. God has set Christ in the most, the most advantageous place for the children, for the sons. Why? Because right now, just like when Christ came, remember, he, he suffered being tempted because that's what he needed to do his work. These were like tools to make a great high priest. But he's not doing that anymore. Now he's over here. He's in the majesty. He's in the majesty. He's bringing many sons to glory. He's drawn them. He's drawn them with bands of love. Drawn them. Showing them. I loved, I loved you with an everlasting love. 
He brings you into the kingdom, and then he says, you want to know why I brought you in? So you can be with me where I am. That's why. I want you to be with me where I am. I want you to see my glory. Remember now, Jesus is at the right hand of God. Right hand. This We're talking about the right hand. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Psalm 1611 makes this very clear. In thy presence is fullness of joy. More specific, Lord. Give me something more specific. I know you're it's full of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You're never going to be without pleasures and glory. Now, are you willing to pass up temporary pleasures for pleasures forevermore in the majesty? <laughs> you're in the majesty, right? You're, you're one of the royal blood, all right? You've got privileges. There's things you can do that, oh, only those that are sons can do now. You're sons, okay? Now, you, you've made part of this majestic order, and in that, you have pleasures forevermore. Pleasures. God made man to appreciate pleasure. Why? So we'd know what he's talking about when he says at my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. There's pleasures, and they're for you. They're for you. If you're a son, if you've taken up your cross and followed after me, he says, because I overcame, I sat down on my father's throne. Now, if you'll overcome, you can sit down with me in my throne, in the majesty. Not only is the right hand of God known for a place of labor, See, it's a place where intense labor, Christ is working. He's bringing many sons to glory. That's a full-time job. Jesus is not a part-time Savior. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with part-time believers. The right hand of God is, is a significant place. It's a special place that God has prepared for Christ. For Christ. See, we don't get to stay if Christ leaves. If Christ should ever leave the right hand of God, if, if, this, if this should be that God, if Christ was expelled from glory, you would have to go too. All of these things, I'm going to list some things here that I just thought about as I was considering the majesty. At the right hand of God, this special place that God's prepared for Christ to do this work of bringing many sons to glory. There's, it, it, you could go on and on and on, and I'm not going to go on and on and on, just a little. Majesty, leadership, it's the right hand of God. Jesus is leading the, the pack, right? Amen. He has authority, all right? There's nobody that can stay his hand. He has power. He's ruling the nations, right? He has strength. There's not any foe that can come against Christ's strength. He has glory and righteousness and salvation and safety and exaltation and productivity and recognition and intercession and substance and provision and eternal life and pleasures forevermore. It's all at the right hand of God and it's all for you in Him. Amen. See, we, we, we got to be in Him. And there really is there no other place we would rather be. And we found that He's altogether lovely. Everything Jesus does... I want to do. I want to be a part of it. Amen. See, I've called you. You've all been called to do a specific work. And so it would behoove you to put your hand to the plow and find out what you can do for the Savior. What can you do? There's something you can do. Do it because there's pleasures forevermore. And if it hurts to do it, do it in light of the pleasures that are up ahead. Do it in light of being where he is up ahead. But do it. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. So where did that come from? God's made you. God's made you to look out for number one. <laughs> Can I say it like that? <laughs> no man ever hated yet his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. He, every man that's built into him to make provision for himself and his family. Isn't that what it says? If you don't do that, what, you're worse than an infidel, right? If 
you don't take care and why God do it that way? Why did he do it? Did, did, did God want us to be selfish? No, that's what I'm talking about, being selfish. I'm talking about being wise. Being wise and saying, now look, I only got two loaves of bread. And my children are hungry. I'm going to feed my children. Because this is what God does. God feeds his children first. It's what he does. He provided a way of salvation for those that were heirs of salvation. This is what he did. He made a way. He made a provision. There's no greater satisfaction to, to be in Christ Amen. who is seated at the right hand of God. So see, God made a provision that is so appealing to those who are serious about God. So appealing in all the exceeding great and precious promises, all these promises that he drew you in with. God's going to fulfill every single one of them in the person of Christ Jesus. Not one promise will ever be fulfilled outside of Christ. Amen. So see, God's given us this, this part of his nature because it's needful. It's needful. See, can you imagine what people would be like if they didn't have this, this, this characteristic of God? Well, we've, we've, see, we've seen what some people who don't have it do. They sit down and say, everybody else can feed us. Now, nah, it's just in passing, but you know what I'm saying. This part, this part of characteristics of God is necessary to motivate people to follow after God. And, and I'm getting close to the end. Now, they, God's put so many characteristics and attached them to this right hand of God and none of them are, are like optional. We need all of them. We need all of the things that God's attached to this. We need them because they, they address some part that needs to be done. Some part of your person that, that needs, needs all the characteristics of the way he talks about Jesus. How about this one? Psalms 38, 6, 36, 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the rivers of thy pleasure. Amen. Now you, you think about that in the middle of a trial. It's okay to be, to be sad. It's okay to be cast down. But it's not okay to be destroyed. It's okay to be tempted and to be drawn. You feel, you feel the tug, you're being drawn. Say, oh, this isn't anything compared to the rivers of its pleasure. This isn't anything. This light momentary affliction... It, when you see it that way, now you can overcome it. Light and momentary. It's, it's not going to last forever, but his pleasure is going to last forever. Amen. So see, there's a sense in which, since you're seated with Christ in heavenly places, you're already drinking of the rivers of his pleasure. That's right. yeah, you're, you're, you're getting the first fruits now. You're tasting of the powers of the world to come Amen. as you abide in Christ, yeah, as, you're, as you're seated with him. Are you drinking of the rivers of God's pleasures? I mean, when you think about Christ, do you feel invigorated? Invigorated. Oh, I want to be like Jesus. Well, where'd that come from? Oh, you've been drinking. <laughs> I can see you've been drinking at the rivers of God's pleasure. You've been, you've been, you've been drinking. The right hand of God speaks of ultimate satisfaction. Ultimate. Christ had the greatest trial, right? He paid the greatest price. He went through the greatest sorrow. He went through the greatest suffering. And he entered into the greatest joy. The greatest pleasure. This was reserved for Christ. This place was made for Christ. And now we're going to get in on it as we're in him. Amen. For now we see through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 makes this very clear. Right now we don't see everything as it really is. We, since we can see it. I praise God we can see it. It may be through a glass darkly, but we can make it out. But then, we live for the then. We're then people, okay? I'm one of the then people, all right? I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. Now, there, to some degree, <laughs> he'll give you like a, like a glimpse 
You ever notice every once in a while I'll give you a glimpse? All right? You've been faithful over a few things here. Take, take a glimpse. Take a glimpse. I'll pull the curtain back just for a second. Oh, oh, too bad you asleep. That's right. You, you were tired. Face to face. Now I know in part, but then, but then. <laughs> now I realize that I don't see everything rightly. But then, oh, then I shall know even as I also am known. I'm going to know. When I get there, I'm not going to say, which one's Jesus? <laughs> not going to happen. Not going to happen. Abiding in the person of Christ has made you ready. See, it's made you ready. See, if you got there and you didn't understand, Jesus would have failed. And Jesus doesn't fail. Abiding in the person of Christ is the closest any man is ever going to get to God. Not going to get any closer. See, God's going to look at the assembled universe, all the believers that Christ has made perfect, and he's going to see a perfect image of his son. And he's going to be so pleased, he's going to say, Son, I'm moving in, day. I'm moving in. I'm moving in. I've examined it, and you've done good work. Good work. And I'm moving in, son. I'm moving in. I, 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 I can't help myself. I'm moving in. You've, you've, you've made me a good house. You've prepared a good house. And I'm moving in. There'll never come a time when we can fellowship or relate to God outside of the person of Christ. In the ages to come, millions and billions of years, since there's no time, you see what I'm saying, speaking as a man, we'll still be glorying in the majesty. We'll still be pleasing the Father. We'll still be doing the will of Him. We'll be doing what seems good unto you as you abide in Christ. Christ will never cease to be our covering. Never. Never. He'll always be our propitiation. The one, the one that, that we live in and move in and have our being. Now see, <laughs> Christ is the man. Christ Jesus. He's the one that God chose to bring the sons home to abide in forevermore. He, he's it. And now he's already given you to have a love for him. So what do you think is going to happen when you get there? I mean, you, you, you love the son. I've kissed the son. I've kissed the son. You imagine on the day, it, I, it was me. I kissed the son. He wasn't angry with me. <laughs> I re highly recommend that, by the way. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this. You don't, be, don't be mixed up by what God's doing. They were mixed up. They didn't get it right. They didn't see it right. But Peter didn't just throw them out the door and say, no, you, he, he opened it up, didn't he? He showed them. Oh, if you could just know that Christ is at the right hand of God, exalted. It changes everything. changes your whole perspective. The very thing that these people were witnessing in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was actually a confirmation that God had highly exalted Jesus. And they couldn't see it. Everything that God has for His people at some point always comes through the hands of Jesus. That's, what, that's not what Peter said. That's what he's telling them. In our text, we can see that Peter was able to quickly put things together now, we know, we've, we've probably all witnessed someone do this. Someone in the assembly saw what was going on and, and they sprung to action. They put it together for us. They said, look at this. Look at how these things fit together. And all of a sudden, oh, I see it. You're right. What was that? Jesus. They, see, they saw him high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. We know by experience and the scripture that nothing of any eternal value can be had outside of Christ doing it. So see, Christ, this has already been brought up. When you get a good thought, when you see something more clearly, the, how, how, so how do I glorify God in that? Attach it to the right hand of God. Attach it that Jesus is reigning. Attach it that he, he gave me this. See, what does that do? That glorifies him. Now, see, I, somebody said to me years ago, it's not just that we've gotten really smart. 
You know, I mean, I see all you and you're doing, you're doing well. You're walking, you're running. But I'm not going to look at you and say, well, you, you're really, really good. No, I see Christ in you. And see, what does that do? That glorifies the Father. And it, we, can, we can openly acknowledge this, that all of our righteousness, if we had all of our righteousness together, let's just pile it all up on the stage. When it was all said and done, it'd just be filthy rags. That's what it would be. But see, God, the, God, the righteousness that God imputes and gives to men is not filthy rags. It's real, it's substantial, and we know it works in you when you start sanctifying yourself. See, when you, when you make the decision, I'm not going that direction because I'd have to leave my Lord. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. So what, what's happened? This direct connection between the right hand of God, the Christ that's there, and you has been made. You're reigning in life by that one, Christ Jesus. So, even though all flesh is grass, it is grass, you know, and the glory of man is a flower of grass, in spite of all that, God's working in you, both the will and do of his good pleasure. See, it, the body's only a hindrance for people who allow it to be a hindrance. Th that really is it, the bottom line. I've known people that you would think, they can't do that. They can't. They're doing it. And they'd be the first ones to tell you, it's because God's empowered me. Yeah, amen. Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. He, he, he openly admitted that. And then all the things that he went through. You look at all the things that Paul went through. How could he do that? How could he endure that? Say, Paul, you, you can't get on a boat anymore. <laughs> You've had a lot of misfortune on boats. You got to stay out of those towns. They like to beat you. He did it anyway. Why did he do it? Because he was connected to the one at the right hand of the majesty on high. He was, he was being funneled power. And he was overcoming so my exhortation to the whole body of Christ, that's the whole body, that is, is to continue. All right, you've been walking in the Spirit, you've been walking in the light, continue, keep, keep moving forward. Colossians 2, 6, I'll close with this, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. See, this is safe. This is safe. We, we've all got trials between now and next year that we'll experience. And next year I'm expecting to hear some great stories of victory. Of the things that you overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The things that you, the people that you testified to about what God's been doing in you. See, this is how you're overcoming. And in the end, you're going to be delivered safely to the right hand of God. And you're going to reign with Christ even as He overcame. Oh, Soon this too shall pass.